welcome to the 28th annual CSR conference at the Miami Marriott Dateland. We have the opportunity to hear from Mr. Richard Nagel, our Director of Clinical Services, present on the advancements and latest technologies in cardiac and liver imaging. Join us for this interesting conference. As I said, I've been doing cardiac imaging for about 30 years and lately it's been taking off in the Caribbean and Central America. And I've been working with the cardiologists and radiologists putting chest pain clinics together and setting up protocols for scanning and medicating the patients. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of a, a slideshow. A lot of this stuff you folks may already know. Um, what you don't, you know, please ask questions. Uh, I also brought a, a workstation which I use to train the physicians on how to do the post-processing on the cardiac images. And in the second talk, it will be um, on Y90 and embolization of livers and how to segment that out. So without any further ado, we started out with calcium scoring was the exam of choice for many years on the four slice, the eight slice, the 16 slice. Uh, it basically gave a, an uh, an idea for the clinicians to know how much atherosclerotic disease was present. And you know, atherosclerotic disease doesn't necessarily mean that there's a stenosis or soft plaque, but it's usually a good marker. So, you know, using the CT scanners, and now we're using 64s, 128s, 256, 360s, whatever it may be. But typically with a, a 64 slice gated study, it does a beautiful um, you know, calcium score. So why do we do this? A lot of the places, uh, I was just in one Caribbean nation and they've started charging um, patients $50 to come in and have a non-contrast calcium score. Um, why? Because now you could possibly populate the, you know, the cardiologist schedule as well with plasties instead of screening angios. So one of the things that we look for is we give them, uh, we develop a worksheet. I mean, in each of the Caribbean nations are, are a little different, right? I mean, um, you know, Puerto Rico, for example, has a high level of diabetes on it, high uh, blood pressure. So we try to find the risk factors, and these are some of the common risk factors that are found uh, that uh, lead to coronary artery disease or cardiac disease. So um, I usually put together or build a uh, questionnaire for the patient as they come in. I'm six foot tall, 260 pounds, um, and these are some of the risk factors that I have in my life. The presence of calcium in the, in the heart, right? So it's not used as a Bible for the diagnosis of the patient, right? You're going to be using the patient's history how they feel, what their lab works are like. But if it's a patient off of the street, you're going to give them a report that's gonna tell them that they have X amount of calcium score or volume within their coronary arteries. Um, this could lead to maybe having a nuclear study after that, maybe having a CT angiogram after that, or maybe really just going and having an, uh, a cardiac catheterization from there. More or less, I use the report to put the fear of God into a lot of these patients, right? They might not have a high score, but they might be a diabetic that has high cholesterol and they're running a 200 calcium score. These are reversible things so that they take care of themselves. They could actually reverse this and cardiologists use this to help try to get the patients back on the right track. If not, then you're just entering them into the system to have the next set of tests or battery of tests. Um, and if you have a fast enough CT scanner as a 128 slice scanner, then you're able to go in and do um, the, the angiogram part from there. The way that we work this at some of the Caribbean and Central American countries is we'll do the calcium score, have the radiologist evaluate it, also look at the lung and the mediastinum on it, and then we will decide based on the score, not solely on the score, that if it's above 400, for example, now they qualify for CT angio. And if you have the ability to medicate that patient at that point, you can bring their heart down, 
You've already got them on the table and you can inject them with 100 cc's of contrast and move forward through the next exam. But the score should not strictly be based on, on how you treat the patient. Uh, I work with several radiologists in South Florida that treat the patient, not the score. So if the patient shows more signs and there might not be a huge score, but maybe those atherosclerotic markers are in the left main or in the LAD or the bifurcation, they might wanna move forward from there as well. So that moves us right on to cardiac CTA of the coronaries, right? I love doing this. I've been doing this since 1999 on an electron beam CT scanner in Miami Beach. Um, it was the fastest CT scanner of the time. They moved to a four slice, six slice. GE bought the Imatron company that made Electron Beam. And then as we keep gradually getting faster and faster, we get that temporal resolution that radiologists look for, right? In a 0.35 rotation, which gives us the best image quality that we could ask for. So why do they have this done? You know, it's not just because they have a high calcium score. Um, it could be that other exams were non-conclusive, maybe a nuclear scan that was non-conclusive, or maybe they, um, they had a previous heart attack, or maybe this is a follow-up for post-ACB for graft patency. I mean, all of those things can be, you know, done at the same time. As radiologists, you're well aware that they shouldn't have a calcium score if they've had any major intervention in their heart to begin with. It kind of eliminates themselves from the first step and puts themselves into a follow-up step of either a catheterization or possibly even a CTA. So I have patients ask me all the time, should I have a CTA done or, or should I go to my cardiologist and have a catheterization done? I mean, the gold standard is a catheterization, but it's highly more invasive than a CTA is. Uh, I would much rather have a CTA myself first to see if there is any reason to take myself up to that next step or maybe talk to the cardiologist. But I mean, are any of you folks doing cardiac imaging at your facilities as of yet? Yeah? Do you have a relationship with your cardiologist as well? That's fantastic. I mean, I love the sites that, that the cardiologist and the radiologist work together. Uh, one of the sites that I was just at in Belize, they had the same thing and, and it, it worked out extremely well. The radiologist would sit in the room, look at the images, the cardiologist would get the patient's heart down and they would work together to get the best possible answers and move on to, you know, the, the next study if there was another study. Uh, it also allows the radiologist and the cardiologist to decide whether or not there needs to be a cardiac cath from there. I mean, I don't know a cardiologist that wouldn't rather do a plasty than a screening, right? Because there's much more revenue in bringing in positive patients into the, uh, the lab. So with that being said, uh, I'm gonna move on to some imaging and show you just about how uh, 3D is involved in this, right? So I loaded up a single phase I can also pull in the angiogram as well. So I can evaluate the angiogram and the CT at the same time. So up in the top right viewport, you can see the angio. You can see over here that the, it's the coordinates of the, of the cath lab that they have there. And each of these different ones are the different positions in the cath. And if I click on that, it brings the CT to the exact same position that's represented on the cath. The way that these CTs, for those that don't typically read these every day, is you start at a head first position here like this. You want to start out at the ostium of the main, the left main. You can see there's a little bit of atherosclerotic disease here. A little bit of soft plaque happens to be sitting here on this patient as well. What we would do is we would grab onto the center of this and we would put this as our pivot point for the vessel. So now I thickened this up. So I personally feel that we can go between a three and a five millimeter increment. So if I come over here, I can see a thicker vessel, gives me a better idea. Is it something that I would use to do a measurement? No, we could do that in the next step. But this is where I can acclimate myself to the possible processes going on in this patient at that time. 
So, and what I can do is I can take this vessel and I can rotate it and I can evaluate the whole thing on the fly based on what the cath position is. So if I click on another cath view here, it brings me up to a great look at the bifurcation and the circumflex, right? So the same thing is I would come over here, I would get in the middle, I would pull this over here. You can see that this over here is going to be a parallel view, a parallel view which is thicker, and then we have a perpendicular view which is going to be the cross-sectional view of that particular artery. So I could actually scroll up and down that, and if I grab onto the planes, so that's nice. And for those of you that go a little further back, right, in, in the history of, of, of imaging cardiac CT, there was a physician, his name was Stefan Achenbach, and he was from Siemens. And I worked with him in Germany for a while, and he was one of the first ones that didn't want all the bells and whistles, right? Straightening vessels out, curved planary formats, multi-planar reconstructions. He really liked the fact that he could use an MPR or a thickened MPR to roll and follow the barrel of the vessel. Using the thickened view and the other two views, this guides him to the parallel and the perpendicular view as he goes down. So as we move forward, right, this particular workstation, you can see the arrows at the top were in what's called a slice view. Most 3D companies have that. You can see heart extraction is next which I really don't use. I mean, it's nice for documentation or showing a, a referring physician. General, I like this part. So this is for cardiologists like a vertical view of a straightened MPR and a curved planar MPR, whereas radiologists like it to be a, a horizontal view. So what we have here is you can see down on this bottom viewport over here, this is the RCA. Here is the straightened view of the RCA. Where you see the arrow right here, that is where the first cross-section view is. So this is not a cross-sectional view of the artery itself. It's a cross-sectional view of the center line that's been driven through that vessel all the way. So I can come up to the top of this and I can rotate this around. One of the reasons I would do that is to see is it visual? Is this one part where it looks like in that proximal portion of the RCA? Is it got a little bit of plaque there? And as I rotate it around, it looks like the barrel is a little bit narrowed right there. And it also gives me the ability to come over here and see the atherosclerotic disease, but at the same time, I can see all of the bifurcations as they come off of that vessel. How would, you, how would you manage that? Would you give it a numeric value? Would a radiologist say, that looks like a 37.6% stenosis on that vessel? Said no radiologist ever, right? Every radiologist is gonna say, mild, moderate to severe, let's go to the cath lab now. So, but one of the ways we can look at that, remember what we said about this arrowed view right here. This arrowed view is going to give us that first cross section. So if I come over to this little golf tee and I say, hmm, this is my first normal and that's my second. So by saying, this is my first normal, this is my second normal, it's gonna give me a stenosis up in the top right of 33%. So I could say that there's a mild stenosis to moderate maybe stenosis, depending on how you feel about it, the way that you would look at that. Um, I do mine quantitative. You can do a qualitative or quantitative. Radiologists vary depending on whether you're uh, an interventional radiologist or a, a cardiac radiologist. They, they tend to use maybe a, a single measuring point between an average of first normal to second normal at the other side of the um, stenosis. So this image over here is our MPR, it's a curved MPR, which will rotate around and around and around. This one over here is going to give us a global view. Like I said, this is the histogram. So if you look at this histogram on each of the vessels as you come across, you can see that first part right there 
there's a little bit of a drop in the beginning. And that drop is represented by that stenosis or that soft plaque where the contrast doesn't completely fill it out. So if I come over to the second one, so I've got a list of them here, right? I've got a whole pack. So if I come over to my LAD, it's the same thing. I can take the LAD and I can rotate that around. Let me change the window and level on that a little bit. And you can see there's a little atherosclerotic disease in there as well. But if you look at the histogram, nothing really kind of gives it away as, hey, there's something that you really need to be aware of here. If you wondered about this spot right here, so that's one of the places, anytime you know you have a little bit of beat of the heart, you might get a little bit of motion and it might pull the center line off from center just a little bit. So you would just go in and modify that a little bit. It gives you a little pencil. I would say, no, 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 it comes up here like that. And then ask the system to re-identify it. There we go. And then we would come to the next one and you can see all of the vessels here are highlighted. So if there was a specific vessel that you wanted to look at, you could open it from there. And the last vessel we would look at there is we would go over to the circumflex. And here's the circumflex. Where there seems to be, even when we rotate here, there seems to be a bifurcation, but there seems to be maybe a little bit of disease in there as well. So you could print these images out on any workstation. You could create a little DICOM simple report, which you could send over to PACS. Now, those of you that do cardiac imaging, do you, any of you do functional cardiac imaging as well? Do you do perspective? Do you know the difference between perspective and retrospective gating? So perspective is if you've got that ideal heart rate, right? Right in the money of maybe 60 to 70 beats per minute, right? Un under medication. Uh, I would do it perspectively, a little less radiation, uh, and it will give you a beautiful study if the heart rate is right. Now, if you do it retrospectively, you're gonna go back to the sinogram data, the helical spiral data, and you're gonna grab that data, and you're gonna say, hey, between the R to R, I wanna grab 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and you would reconstruct it, and you're now trying to find the best phases that represent the resting phase where, or a no motion image on the coronary arteries, like, 70, 75, 80, typically great for the left side of the heart. It shows the LAD and the circumflex really well. But if you're looking at the RCA, you might have a great heart rate, right? Down at 60, but it gets that little bit of quiver at the end, uh, that mechanical quiver on the RCA, and you might have a little bit of motion on there. So there may be a reason to step back and go and, 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 and do that for that. Are there any questions on that? I'm sure you know a lot of this. I just like talking about it, so I keep talking if you want. So the other thing that we do is when we're all finished with these studies, we go in and what we do is we save them. All the companies do it, but I like the way this one does it because if we go in and we save this image, it saves it as a bookmark, sends it to PACS. So when you're reading this on PACS, the radiologist might not read this study while they're sitting in the room with the patient, but you can capture your steps or your bookmarks and send them back to PACS or to the workstation that you use wherever it may be, and then open it up and it will open up exactly to where you left off when you were evaluating it. And well, there's two different ways of working that, right? So you said you're doing cardiac studies. Do your technologists do any of the reconstructions for you? and they save what you ask for. And that's the way I was taught. So, right, I'm a technologist. I consider myself the butcher. Sounds silly, right? You're giving me this piece of meat and I'm gonna take this data set, which is like a big loaf of bread, and the radiologist has already told me what cuts they want. So my goal is to be the best that I can be and go and save these. So if I come back over here to this thumbnail down here in the bottom, and I double click on that, it's gonna open that study exactly off to where we were using it before. So when I save this for a radiologist, 
I save it with all three of the coronaries so that they can go and rotate them all. They can go evaluate them for stenosis. And I also save them the other image where they can rock the images back and forth. So the days of saving a still image are, are gone. I mean, how many times a technologist saved a couple of images for you? you go, that would have been great if it had been in the middle and turned a little bit to the side. So I got to call CT and have them do that. So if I can get you 95% of where you need to be by saving a snapshot or a bookmark, which is going to get you where you need to start your read or complete your read, um, that's the goal that most of the technologists have. And that's all I have for you on this. I appreciate your time.